The pattern of St. George and the Dragon is one we've all seen repeatedly throughout our lives, most likely in a movie where this pattern of a hero slaying a dragon, or some other kind of monster, with a maiden looking on from the side is used again and again. You'll also find it in children's books, paintings, statues, and holy icons. This is a sacred image because it is inexhaustible. For some reason, we can return to it again and again, see it played out in yet another movie, read about it in yet another story, and yet, we don't mind seeing it again. Why? I think like other biblical and mythological stories, we continue to be fascinated by this image because it represents a pattern so fundamental to how we experience life that we sense its perpetual relevance. It is a fundamental pattern of reality. One way to begin to see this is to consider the image as representing you. Not just St. George represents you, but also the horse, the dragon, and even the maiden. I believe St. George represents the higher part of you, the part of you that's closer to God, the part of you that knows right from wrong, that is capable of being heroic and dutiful, that can exercise reason, that realizes the wisdom of considering the long-term consequences of things and not just the short-term. Because of this, St. George is part of you that can plan, set goals, and dream of how your life could be better. He can also criticize the things you do that are destructive. He gets on you when you procrastinate and makes you feel bad when you eat that extra piece of chocolate cake. St. George can also think abstractly, theoretically, and contemplatively. He can even think about thinking. And being all these, it makes a certain amount of sense to associate St. George with your head, your higher self. St. George is very smart and very wise. The only problem is that he's also very weak. When it comes to sheer power and muscle, the horse has much more of it. And the dragon? The dragon is capable of going into beast mode because the dragon is beast mode. The dragon can easily eat or roast St. George or the horse if they're not careful. The horse then is your middle self. The horse is wild by nature and animalistic, but the horse is also reasonably intelligent and a social animal. As such, the horse is both sensitive to social cues and can be trained by St. George. The horse is moved by honor and shame and can put off immediate impulses for midterm goals with the help of social pressures. You can think of the horse as being located in our chest, where we generally feel emotions of pride and shame. It makes sense why the horse is part of us because we're inherently social beings. And so a large part of our potency relies on our sensitivity to the needs of groups and our desires to belong to them. By now, it's probably pretty obvious where the dragon lives, down in your lower parts. The dragon is a dragon, a beast, a wild potency. It cares about eating, protecting itself from threats, reproducing, and establishing dominance. The dragon is your passions. The dragon is pretty stupid, but very, very powerful. And as I said before, it's capable of eating or wounding St. George and the horse if they're not careful. The dragon only cares about the present and satisfying its needs right now. Then there's the maiden. In many versions of the story, George saves her from being eaten by the dragon and they are married. So what part of you does she represent? She represents your possibility, your potential, for out of possibility can come new life when you form a proper union with her and fill her with identity but she can also be killed. Your potential new and better life is extinguished by the dragon, if not conquered. In one version of the story, there are many, the maiden is about to be sacrificed to the dragon by the townspeople when St. George and the horse ride in and confront the dragon. You only need to think of the way you can literally see the life and potential of a drug addict being eaten by their addiction for a potent example of what it might mean for the maiden to be eaten to appease the dragon. But of course, there's the opposite of this, the person who subdues their passions and unifies themselves with a beautiful future bearing new life into the present. In my preferred version of the story, St. George doesn't actually kill the dragon. He sticks it down the throat with a long lance bearing a cross at the top of it, fixing the beast, pinning it in place, subduing it, conquering it, but not killing it. With the dragon subdued, George and the maiden lead it by a leash back to the town where it then guards the town against invaders. We often make the mistake of trying to kill our passions outright, rather than conquering them and putting them into the service of a higher ideal. If these are all parts of you, 
then it becomes understandable why you can feel a conflict with yourself. For example, you have all sorts of noble intentions to get important work done around the house. That's St. George. But then you find yourself being carried off by the horse when your family wants to go to the movies. And the dragon takes over when you get to the theater and are presented with all the yummy concessions at outrageous prices, which St. George gets incensed about. But then the dragon pins him to the ground as the dragon applies copious amounts of fake butter to the jumbo tub of popcorn. And he doesn't forget the refill. This symbolic division of the different parts of our internal makeup keeps getting discovered from time to time. Plato was among the first, and he had the same tripartite division, but with a man, a lion, and a monster being the categories. Notice how a lion is a social animal. Freud had the id, the ego, and the superego. Professor Jonathan Haidt recently collapsed the three into two in his book, The Righteous Mind, and compared it to a rider on top of an elephant. Haidt's main point in that book was that we think the rider is in control of the elephant, but the reality is that the rider serves the elephant. In other words, the horse and the dragon are really in charge. We may have to sadly admit that for most of humanity's members, the lower parts are indeed often in charge. But that's why this image is perennially relevant and perpetually inspiring. It shows us that it is indeed possible to integrate ourselves into a coherent whole, with our higher self in the position of reigning over that which is below. The fact that this is seen so rarely in humanity is why it's so inspiring. When we encounter people who embody this image, we can't help but be positively impressed. Importantly, the image also suggests to us how we go about achieving this state of being. In order for this image to work, St. George must have first trained the horse and developed a caretaking relationship with it, and only then could they effectively synergize their abilities in order to conquer the beast. In other words, we can use our wisdom to harness our powerful social impulses of pride and shame, the horse, to keep our passions under control and put it to good purpose. This is why it's so much more effective to engage in any endeavor of discipline along with other people, such as a family, a group of friends, a team, or a local church, rather than going it solo. Whether it's athletics, religious aestheticism, or losing weight, all these things are made easier in the company of others. Our social nature is more powerful than our head, but the head can train it, bridle it, befriend it, and become one with it. St. George's lance is another part of the image that tells us how to conquer the dragon. The lance is an axis around which all of your different parts can orient themselves to a common goal. Instead of giving all of your parts latitude to pursue their own whims, especially the dragon, which will pursue whatever seems most tasty in the moment, you have to pin down the dragon into place with an axis that orientates all your different parts to something higher than yourself. The same principle was at play when Moses lifted the brazen serpent in the wilderness. When the Israelites were looking in different directions, the serpents below them would bite and kill them. But when they looked at the same thing, at the same time, the serpents had no effect. This image suggests that this higher orientation point is the cross and God. But if you're not ready for that, realize that any noble goal directed towards something higher than yourself can still unify your different parts. The realization of this image doesn't happen by accident or luck. The skill needed for St. George to train and mount the horse and then, working together, subdue the dragon comes only with great practice, persistence, and wisdom. That's why, when I'm struggling to master my passions, I will take some time to contemplate this image for insight into where I'm missing the mark. Once you can see how this image represents reality at the level of you as a person, you can begin to see how higher levels of reality, such as a family, a community, or even a nation, operate on the same principles. In fact, if you think about it, most social institutions, such as government, education systems, and formal religions, exist largely in order to train the horse and conquer society's dragons. This is just one way that you can interpret this image and this fundamental pattern of reality, and I hope it's been useful for you. I wish you well in your own efforts to master the powerful beast within you, win the heart of the beautiful maiden, and bear new life into the present.